And there were times I didn't feel like being that. I didn't want to be on. But then I felt I always had to be on. That's me. Yeah. You know? Be it now, and then it will come to you. You can't wait till you get it to become that thing. We want to welcome you guys to the DNA of Greatness podcast. I'm your host, Aquarius Wave, and this right here. This man right here is the epitome of greatness and one of the few individuals that I'm willing to listen to with complete open ears and actually take advice from. Why? Because he's a living model of it. Coach Bobby Bluford, would you like to say what's up to the people? What's up, guys? Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to always, uh, once a week, to sit down with you guys and talk about life, talk about chasing greatness. Um, I can't believe it's episode seven already. Yep. Uh, this is my favorite day of the week um, to share with my nephew, Aquarius. And to hopefully give you guys, you know, some valuable nuggets that you can take with you for the next six, day, six days until we meet again. Absolutely. But for today, as we have met once again, for those who came from former episodes, we want to introduce you to a subject that is at the epicenter, at the core of your very existence. And I'm not saying that to be extra. I'm saying that because it's the truth. And that subject is the identities that we create for ourselves, right? Now, the reason why this theme of identity came up is actually for a multitude of different reasons, but there's been a kind of behind the scenes conversation that's prolonged with Coach and I, where we've been in you know, a hyper growth stage, right? God has been taking us through a process of just pruning and weaning away everything that is unnecessary for that next level within our journeys. And in the midst of that, there's been this kind of looming thing of identity, right? Who we see ourselves as, what we identify ourselves as, and how those things have kept us in essential bondage and how letting go of those identities that we once held on to is the freedom that we truly seek and is, again, what's going to propel us forward. And so the reason why I felt it was mandatory to talk about the subject is because Everything in our lives, everything we do, everything we believe, everything we tell ourselves about ourselves or the world around us is rooted in identity. And so I felt, again, there's no better person to discuss this with than Mr. Coach Bobby Bluford, the number one greatness coach on the planet. What does identity mean to you? What has it meant for you? And when I brought this subject, what came to mind? Yeah, so... Uh, at the core of my belief system is the five steps to greatness. Uh, for those who don't know, I, I created this this formula, if you will, uh, these steps uh, that if if and when taken mm. can take you to the the completion of any goal or vision you have, anything, and. Proof of that was the fact that after I concocted this idea, these five steps, it wasn't a year or two later, um, if that, that I finally sat down and read a, uh, one of the most famous books uh, in the history of business, uh, Think and Grow Rich, mm. which uh, later was, uh, uh, le was learned to be the precursor to Law of Attraction which many people know about. So that book has the same first two steps as my first two steps, uh, which are want, believe, go, learn, and persist. But at the very forefront of that is this idea that you have to have a clear, uh, palpable, inside your soul, inside your spirit, want the book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, says desire, mm. but a, a deep want to have or be or do this thing. Well, to do that, you have to have an idea of what that looks like. Mm. And so identity is based in part on everything that you see that you want to be and all, I would say, all of our anxiety and all of our um, internal angst is a result of friction mm. between what we see as our current identity mm. and what we desire 
as our current identity. That's so good. So if you desire to be rich, that's the identity you want. But you define yourself, whether it's publicly, whether it's literally, whether it's subconsciously, mm. as a poor person, that creates friction between your soul and your dreams mm. and the reality you live in. And so identity, uh, whether you choose to think about it, address it, work on it or not, uh, is at the forefront of who you are, how you feel, but more importantly, of your ability to move towards what you want to become. Talk about it. Talk about it. So um, that being said, uh, since you refer to one of the all-time classics, a must-read for everybody, uh, there's probably uh, five books that I would recommend to everybody. One of them is Think and Grow Rich, and another one of those is Psycho-Cybernetics, right? One that I brought up a few times. Mm -hmm. um, essentially written by a man by the name of Dr. Maxwell Maltz. He was a former plastic surgeon back in the 30s and the 40s became a psychotherapist when he realized that it had nothing or at least how we saw ourselves and how we presented ourselves, how we showed up in life had very little if nothing to do with the physicality and everything to do with what we believed or saw ourselves being, doing mm -hmm. and having, right? So he had examples of he would have somebody come in for, let's say, a surgery on their nose. They believe their nose is too big. People saw them as weird looking. And so they would get, let's say, their nose slimmed up. And the person would come back and their entire life was changed, right? They gain all the job opportunities, promotions, you know, they can't keep opportunity away from them. They have all the relationship uh, success in the world. They have things happening within their finances that they never could have predicted before, right? Money coming from multiple sources, et cetera, et cetera. And even their health, right, starts to get better right. magically, where they would have been a, a overweight, weren't able to lose the weight for 30 years. And now all of a sudden it's falling off of them and can't stay on. And right. what he started to recognize was something had changed in that person's perception of themselves. The person who came in with the big nose didn't necessarily have a big nose in comparison to the rest of society, but they believed that their nose was what was keeping them from, Correct. right? And so as we take this dive into identity, Unc, I wanted to use this podcast as an opportunity to really get deep. And one thing that comes so naturally to you at this point in your journey is just being honest and vulnerable, right? Yeah. Like sharing those aspects of like what we are going through, what we've gone yeah. through, where we are and allowing people to know it's like, you're not the only one going through this right? mentally and emotionally, right? Like we're all have this kind of resistance at some point. There's some like sort of contention that happens in a majority of us because we are born, bred, created to desire. And to yes. want greater yes, than Yes, absolutely, much, right? yes. A fan, like it's a part of who we are. And so this identity shifting is something that is a perpetual part of our experience. So you're not bad or you're not wrong for it or where you are, right? I guess right. that message. So, Unc, uh, my question to you is, how would you describe, like, where was, the, where was the one time when you started to really craft this identity or, like, create this almost caricature that then became you? Because I know, you know, you have such a story around this mm -hmm. right of like being the kid that you were i'm not gonna give too much away and let you do mm -hmm. that but it's mm -hmm. like you were this kid who was x y and z and then all of a sudden you become this right and then you realize certain things about this um identity that you created and then right. where are you now so if you could just right. dive into that yeah I mean, I yeah know, nobody I no spoilers to the story yeah nobody nobody gives any of us a manual or a book on how our brain is going to develop mm. right the belief systems we're going to have um, the things we're going to like and dislike the things about us we're going to like and dislike nobody gives us a manual instead we learn those things um, in two ways through experience mm. but more importantly i said in the, in the previous episode we, we learn those things based upon the reaction the world gives back to us. Mm. So the, I call it the mirror, right? So, and I've used the example about, you know, my, my muscles only feeling good to me because in my environments, people see me and they have a reaction about them. Yeah. So in the context I live in, I value having muscles only because the mirror has told me they're valuable. Whew, that's so good. Right? If you are, and I love this example, it doesn't always land the way I want, um, but 
the, in the black community, we mm. like women bigger mm. and thicker. And this is a real podcast. We get we get, get down yeah. deep. So <laughs> exactly. no okay. offense intended, mm. right? So there are women that are not in the black culture, Hispanic, Caucasian, mm. Asian, who may be bigger, maybe thicker, mm. right? Where where in their communities, that is not an ideal size for a woman. Mm. But if that woman lived in a in a black neighborhood, she would feel attractive as heck. Correct. <laughs> but be, same woman, but because yeah. she lives in an affluent area, she feels overweight and fat. Mm. And that is a true thing. That is a reality in our world. Absolutely. Nothing about the woman is different other than the mirror that sees her. Mm. The mirror through which she sees herself is different. So I say that to say that everything that we experience adds to or detracts from what we believe us to be, what we believe our value to be, what we believe our uh, attributes to be. So I grew up predominantly in in, in suburban areas, mm -hmm. uh, army communities, mm -hmm. where I was, you know, one of the fewest black kids, if not the only black kid in my class. And it wasn't a big deal until I realized I also stuttered. So my go-to story I talk about is the time I realized that I stuttered, stuttered, and within 10 minutes of knowing that, I all these differences that I had came to fruition. Yeah. Only black kid. I had I had hair that was different. I had an afro, then I made it into a jerry curl. No one had that. I had dry skin. I couldn't go into the pool without getting out feeling weird. All these things that were just like weird nuances until then, all of a sudden became like these huge parts of me that were different. Hmm. So I began to see myself differently, right? And it, it was it was a it was a, a a rough time, you know, 18, 24 months of my life between 12 and like 14. Wow. Uh, and I was playing sports, so that was that was an escape. And I was decent. I was I was I wasn't. I wasn't horrible, but I wasn't one of the best, you know, kids in basketball or football. But I, I enjoyed it, and I always worked hard at it. But I wasn't naturally great. Uh, but it was a way for me to get away from all the other stuff that made me feel different, mm. right? Because in sports, it doesn't matter. You just play. You try to score. You try to tackle. Whatever the sport demands, you do it. You know, no one, no one really cares about your background, your your parents, your 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 status, your income level, none of that stuff. That's a great equalizer for sure. Yeah, exactly. So to your point is my identity, and most young kids, you know, well, not most, all young people don't have an identity. When you're born, correct. You're, you are, again, there's two, there's two dominant, there's two dominant uh, uh, reflexes, if you will, as, a, mm -hmm. as an animal, mm -hmm. human or otherwise. Right, procreation and survival. So as a as a baby, human, all you know is is survival and you're trying to, you know, you know, understand your environment, but you don't know anything about identity. You just know what can I do to make myself more comfortable. Hmm. If you're hungry, I'm a, if I cry, I get food. If I if I step stand up and I fall, that hurts. So I grab something. So all these things you just learn, right? But identity is not one of them. But as you interact with other humans, you begin to see again the mirror. So you don't you don't fear falling unless the the mirror is is worried. Mm -hmm. So now you view walking as something that's scary because your parents will have a look of worry. All these things make us who we are. Right? So as as you age, you know, zero years old, one years old, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. You begin to see these different responses mm -hmm. the world's given you. Laughter, uh, adoration, love, anger, discipline. Mm -hmm. And they all impact who you are, your identity. And what happens is, inevitably, we attach ourselves to the, to the responses that don't feel good. Mm -hmm. Because our brains are wired to protect us. Absolutely. So it's easy to remember in our souls the, the things that make us feel good, that make us move forward, that are not threatening. But our brains are wired to remember 
the things that threaten our existence. Mm-hmm. So all those things, and whether and whether real or not, whether real or imagined, mostly imagined. We're not running from danger literally, literally anymore. So it's all our brain perceiving what is danger, when in reality it just makes us feel bad. Mm-hmm. So you know, anger, discipline, uh, withholding of love, mm-hmm. embarrassment. All these things become our brain's interpretation of danger, and our brain remembers those things more than the joys and the comfort it feels because it's trying to survive. So as you as you grow, you develop these these uh, this inclination to focus on the things that you have to make sure you look at to protect yourself. And for me, it was at that point it was it was different. It was stutter. It was black. So I chose things that allowed me to escape that. Mm-hmm. Right. I wasn't working yet, so I couldn't choose a job. I had to go to school, so I couldn't choose to stay home. But sports gave me an outlet, right? Mm. Um, and I caught on to it, right? And so I began to to get bigger and stronger. And around you know my, my end of my high school year, going into college, there was this full fledged identity of Co- it wasn't Coach Bobby yet, but it was a superhero. Yeah. It was a buff, badass football player, mm. right? Predicated not even on my my ability to play well, but my ability to work hard to play well. Hmm. And so I built an identity based on that. Hmm. This guy who was who was seen as a hard worker. Yeah. Who was who was who, which was evidenced by how he looked. Mm-hmm. And that be, that has been my identity um for thirty plus years. So And I, now as you know I'm trying to 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 scrape away the parts that I don't, I don't need anymore. I really want to take a dive into this. And by the way, Unc, we are telepathically communicating because yesterday I was writing uh, one of the chapters of this book titled Doing Me Guilt Free, right? And it's in the section of of um, having. and Doing me guilt free? Huh? Doing me guilt free. I like that. And the section right now is, or the last section is the having section. So this specific chapter is having identity. And I think I had opened even with this statement of like this perception of value, right? And I used a painting. Just as you use the individual or that young lady who's going into one of two communities and how she's valued, I said, you know, Mm -hmm. so, okay. Like first, no, actually first I said, how would you value yourself as an individual? Like, what price point would you put on yourself as a human, right? Right. And as most human, individuals, right. in this day and age at least, right, we've gotten a little more sanity as a species. We would say, of course, you wouldn't put a value on a human. Humans are priceless, right? You don't put a price on right, yourself. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yet it all good. we do continuously good. is yeah. put valuations on ourselves, whether it's the workplace and the marketplace or whether it's in relationship, what I bring and do. And so yep. I use this analogy of this painting and i said so the person who has the painting presented to them and says i'll pay ten dollars and the one who says 10 million is it because the painter changed the canvas is it because something changed inherently no it's because of the perception of the individual right Mm -hmm. and so i use that also as a point to say that's kind of this um that's really the futility of external based identity which is the first aspect of our podcast which is what we're getting into right like this image of coach Bobby was actually molded from the negative feedback of your environment in essence. Yep. And so the thing I wanted to get into was specifically about work, because I believe we live in a day and age where work has become um, an idol, right? It's not even about the productivity necessarily or about the results anymore. It's just about how hard I'm working. People use their schedules as ways to demonstrate their value. Yes. amongst one another right look yep. how busy especially in the bay area like places like this look how yep. busy i am look how many meetings i have look how many things i got going on is used as this like social currency and so i wanted to get into this because this is a part i have never completely like delved into in your life is where did you see people or somebody in your life my assumption is pops but where did you see like working hard and that being rewarded Right, because there had to be something subconscious in you that was saying, yeah, like, good point. "Oh, in order good for point. people to see me as a man or valuable in the society, I gotta grind, grind, grind." Where did that come from? Uh, great question. 
Um, and ironically, I don't think it came from my parents. Mm. Right? My dad, my dad was, by the time I, I, I could remember or I, could, I was conscious of what his job was in the army, he was, um, he was a sergeant major. So he was, he was the leader of men. Mm-hmm. Right, he was a drill sergeant, and then became just a sergeant major. So he was the leader of men. So I remember going to his. You know, there's a thing called the barracks. Mm-hmm. It's basically a big old apartment building <laughs> with with uh, single GIs, mm-hmm. single 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 soldiers. Um, he was married, so he had housing. Right, the guys who don't have housing or or early, you know, new in the army, they all live in like this this one dwelling. As individuals, but if you're married, you have your own place with your wife. Mm. If you're older and an officer, or you're older and you're higher ranking, you you also have your own place. So I remember going to this place that he didn't live, but but he had char he was in charge of a certain like a, maybe a whole floor, maybe the whole building, right? I think the whole building actually. So maybe a, a building might have housed fifty soldiers. Mm. Right, all single young guys, right? But he was the one in charge of that building. So I remember going there and like, oh my God, that's, that's Sergeant Major's son. How you, how you doing, Bobby? How you, how you oh, doing? So they're wow. all kissing my butt, right? Because my dad wow. is the Sergeant Major. Yeah. But I don't remember like me me seeing him as a hard worker. I knew he was diligent. I knew he was disciplined. I knew he did something. But I never like, I never witnessed him like changing a carburetor yeah. or working like crazy hours or being, you know what I mean? So... Uh, and my mom, I knew that she was a stay-at-home mom who occasionally uh, did in-home nursing, right? She would, she would like, go to people's houses and do, like, in-home care. Um, and I knew we were, like, working-class people, lower, lower middle class or even upper lower class. Uh, so I knew by nature you had – those people were hardworking mm-hmm. just by nature, right? So, but I never, like, equated it to what they did. Yeah. What I think, what I think it came from, was this idea in my head that no one could judge me negatively based on my work, oh. ethic, Interesting. right? Okay. So once once you have a completed paper, mm. or once you play a game, like if I can't shoot a basketball, you can judge that. But if I practice more than you, yeah. I'm above reproach. Wow. I'm above he criticism. Is the I'm above, you can't, and so and so and so store. I made a point to make sure that that part of my life was always evident. I have guys to this day. In fact, I love it when I meet somebody from high school. I don't meet anybody from junior high because they're all back east, um, or even middle school or elementary because Washington and New Jersey was where I. But anybody from like my sophomore year high school. Mm-hmm on when I run into them I love it because my kids get to hear stuff about me yeah that I told that I tell them that is not rehearsed yeah so I, we, we, we ran into a guy uh, who I, who was a, a junior I think when I was a sophomore in basketball and he was part of the state championship team mm-hmm. um, and he was like yo daddy man he used to get on my freaking nerves man he used to never like he used to run full speed all damn time and I was friends and like and I was I, I had forgotten that story wow but it just reminded me that I that you were never going to be somebody who either watched practice or a game or was on my team that could criticize my work ethic mm. and I knew subconsciously that if I had that then it wouldn't matter how I looked. It wouldn't matter how good I was in the sport yeah. because I could control that. So I think my desire to be the hardest working guy in the gym or in the, on the on the court or in the football field or in the office was was a fear mm. that I couldn't I couldn't com- I couldn't control how smart I was. I couldn't control how good I was, but I could control I could control how hard I worked toward the, the test or the game. Or whatever it was that's so powerful huh so see this is why i wanted to dig into this because i was like i knew there was stuff i don't know about your story i didn't know about the little kid in the barracks like i didn't yeah i, I never envisioned that and now it gives me an even different scope on like even the things you value because even being a leader of men 
Why does that yeah. matter? You saw your yeah. dad as a leader of men, right? Good point. You got you yeah, got that point. you got um that that positive validation because you were connected to this man. Yes, good right? point. Good point. Yeah. So those are things I never would have known. And so uh, just to take a little bit more of um a dive into this work thing. So again, for myself being raised by an entrepreneur, always seeing kind of um this on switch that was never turned off, right? Things were mm -hmm. always rolling. There was no clocking out, et cetera. I think first that developed kind of an awareness. And then secondly, when I started getting, like you're saying, a sort of reward system for my payoff. So for myself, I grew up in the, the world of acting from a very, very young age, right? Yep. And I was able to connect the dots of, okay, if I rehearse this thing and then I'm able to memorize and then I'm able to perform and then I'm able to get the medal and then people like me even more, right? Now I'm even yep. more popular. And I think... It was like that consistent, continuous feedback loop, right? That was saying, well, it's the work itself. I was never actually connotating my talent or like right. my love and my passion for what right. I was doing. It was always the grind and the hustle. And up until recently, for both of us, I think it's really been a point of investigation, right? Yeah. Say like, yeah. why are we, why are we holding our identities? Why are we holding our worthiness in this life based on? how much output we can right. do. And this is something I've I've taken a deep dive again. In this chapter, it really exposed me to things that I wasn't even sure I was aware of or didn't know I was aware of, but it's in every facet of life. Like a mother is oftentimes judged externally by how much she sacrifices for her children, right? Yeah. How much is she doing? If you yeah. know if a mother tells you that she did ten things and another says she did two Right, they're they're gonna praise the one who did the ten. Correct. Simply off of output. Yep. Even yep. if the children with the mother who did two things have better outcomes. Right. It's the strangest thing 100%. that we have in society, right. but you open me up to this new paradigm right now, which is again, it's the one thing that nobody can ever say or ever take away from you, right? If they saw you running the hardest, even if you got last place. You still were the guy who ran the hardest. Exactly. And there is rewards for that individual, at least at a social level. Yes. Right. So when did you come to this place of realizing like, man, this this thing that I've created for myself, this mask or this body armor, whatever it may be, that it's no longer serving me or never really did serve me. This episode of the DNA of Greatness podcast is brought to you by the BTY Symposium. The BTY Symposium is an immersive workshop aimed at getting the student-athletes the tools they need to achieve their ultimate dreams. Whether a one-day or multiple-day format, the symposiums provide an all-inclusive environment that nourishes athletes physically, mentally, and emotionally. Now back to the show. I had been using, I had been using this, this identity um, you know, for years, for 30-plus years, and I, I had I created out of football, mm -hmm. obviously, it was usable in finance, mm -hmm. right? Not not a, a an exact replica. Um, it was closer. It was closer and easier to use the identity in in fitness directly. But what I realized was that the people I was serving, I couldn't I couldn't use just the muscles anymore. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't use just the 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 rough demeanor and ex and exterior that had gotten me so far in my life at, 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 had really propelled me to greatness in a lot of areas. And I was at a point where I was stuck. Mm -hmm. And the identity that I had built built my whole life upon. And my whole life was built upon this identity and and an identity that that allowed me to escape. Again, remember the brain creates these ways to protect you. Absolutely. And I had given my brain like like the perfect alibi. Mm -hmm. Like the perfect alter ego to get away from all these things that I was afraid of. And and so I was it served me well until it didn't. And so this last career switch really made me understand and dive into that word that we talked about investigating. Mm -hmm. And and I really was faced with this this um, understanding that I couldn't use that identity for most of my life anymore. Mm. I couldn't use it with grown children. Yeah, 
I couldn't use it with grown people who was who were struggling with with their weight. I could use it as a football player myself. I could use it maybe even coaching football players, but I couldn't use it. I couldn't use it as a speaker. I couldn't use it as a teacher. I couldn't use it in my workshops. And so the difficulty has been um, understanding and accepting and being kind to myself, like you said in, in your chapter, right? Doing me guilt-free mm -hmm. is, is being, being forgiving of myself for using that as a crutch, mm -hmm. but also being accountable to myself to understand that my identity does not need to be based in the same thing that was a shield and, and a protective measure for all these years. Wow. There is a, there is a turning point. I think all of us are like consistently getting messaging from God. Like at all times, this universe around us is looking to translate, whether it's through literal language or through like, you know, the natural elements, whatever it may be, continuously. And right. I think we're always being called to the very same message. And I think that message is, I believe the message is, it's been true every single time in my life, whether I've listened or not, is let go. Right? Yeah. And I think as human beings who have such a deep, like I use the word addiction most times because it's the only one that's intense enough in our language to really get across how attached we are to our identities, right? Yes. Because some of us, most so of true. us, you know what I mean? So most, most of us have a belief, Unc, that like, well, it's, I like, I can stop when I want to, I guess is the best type of mentality nope. I can connect yeah. it to, right? Well, it's like, I'm just doing this, but if I wanted something different, I, it's like, no, you don't understand. The very premise and basis of your life, the basis of your existence is because you are so addicted, you are so attached, you're so in love with the very same things that are actually keeping you from exactly what you desire in your life. Yes. And that identity is everything. And this is why it's, it's like really doing a number on me right now because I had a moment again writing this book where I'm thinking back to the time when I was an addict, right? And I talk about this, but I don't really go in depth about it because I, I came to realize not too long ago, I mean, a few months ago, I've come to terms with it, but I was ashamed. I was yeah. ashamed of who I was. I was ashamed of the way I showed up in the world. I was ashamed of a lot of things, the people I spent time with, all of that, right? I try to almost pretend like it never happened. Right. Or I would use it as like a blanket statement. It's like, oh yeah, the addiction, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But... For anybody who's ever been in any chemical dependency, you have an understanding that, or at least, yeah, if you come out on the other side of that chemical dependency, at least, you have an understanding that the drug is maybe 10% of the addiction. Maybe. Right? Yep. The drug is the coping mechanism, per se. The drug is the suppressant, the number, the band-aid. But the reason why you're an addict is because of the 90% that yeah. lays below, right? And it's what Unc was saying. The person that you're running from, that's the thing that you're actually hooked to. The yeah. story of who you believe that you are. I be And you're going to get this one up. Yep. I believe that I am so unworthy and undeserving and unacceptable and broken and fallen and I am I am nothing. I am worthless. I am useless. You believe these so tightly and you hold on to them with so much vigor that you are willing to create an entire entity based off of those. 100%, That's right? how in love you are with that. When I say like yeah. in love, I'm not talking about like, oh, you're in love with the muscle. No. Oh, you're in love with the work ethic. No. You are so attached to you're so yeah. addicted to the story of who you believe you are. Right. And that's the pain point. And so I want to take a pivot because identity is one of these things that in this modern culture, we now wear them as we wear them as bragging tools. We wear them as virtue signaling. We use them as ways to get an up on another person, right? Yeah. So, and it's not just the 
I am wealthier, I am this. It's actually, I am poorer, or I am a poverty class. Like, we use those as, as stamps of defining ourselves to say, I'm better and more morally just than you are. Yeah. We use our sexuality, whatever it is, yeah, whatever, exactly. my marginalization. Yeah. Look how marginalized I am. Look how yeah. oppressed I yeah. am. We use yeah. these things and hold on to them, not understanding that we are using that very tool. The thing that we believe is giving us power is actually the thing that's keeping us away from our true power. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Like, um, yeah. I believe that, okay, so if I can be the biggest victim in the world and everybody knows it and I get all the sympathy and attention, right? The quote unquote admiration and affection that I want, I think I am now gaining a sense of control and power. I believe that I'm getting what I want when in reality, I'm in the very opposite direction. And there was a moment, cause you understand this from like, I, I said this, I think in one of our earlier podcasts where you had such a drastic shift when it comes to this thing of anger, right? Like anger used to be something that you used as a means to get people's attention, to get right. people's, um, yeah. I guess you could say to correct behavior and get an outcome right. that you desire right. from others, right? right? Yep. Some of us use more subtle means of manipulation, right? Passive aggressiveness, guilt tripping, right? Shaming tactics, etc. But can you speak to like that person who believed that anger was getting me what I wanted? But yeah. what were the repercussions of that? Because I think this yeah. is where, again, this thing really hits home for folk. It's like, bro. Like, yeah. It, it, the heart, yeah. So, so when you, when you, again, the mirror, right? The mirror, the mirror was, was so, something that told me I wasn't good enough when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 11 years old. The mirror began telling me I was good enough along the same, around the same time I began to be more physically imposing. Right. So my brain and my, and my soul was was married to this new identity because the response I got was all positive, mm. right? Girls liked me, guys admired me on a football field, some of the guys feared me. Um, so you begin to create this identity, right? And I never saw it as anger, right? Because, I mean, I do, I do now, obviously, and I'll get into that, but I just saw it as my job. Mm. Right? So, mm. okay. you know, anyone who knows me knows that, you know, I can literally hit somebody in practice and then hug them and say, I love you and, and go to lunch during our break. Yeah. Right? I can literally call you out during a workout as your coach. And then afterwards, we can laugh about our kids and our kids can hang out. Mm. So I've never seen it as, you know, even as a CFO, I would get on, get on, you know, my subordinates but I never saw it as being mean. Only later did I recognize that it was a tool for me uh, that was learned from this, this not barbaric, but almost barbaric um, identity I had in sports, mm -hmm. right? I, you know, and I was very, very aggressive, right? I wasn't really a fight, I didn't fight a lot. I got into a few fights, but not a lot. So, and maybe because of my demeanor, I got me out of a lot of fights. Yeah. People didn't want to fight me for some reason, right? But I wasn't, so, I, so I'm not, I'm not a, a violent person. I don't even, I don't watch MMA mm -hmm. fights. So I'm not, I'm not naturally a violent person. Um, but I did see a connection between aggressive behavior and compliance mm -hmm. from people, right? Um, but as I told you, as I've told you many times in person, and I think we addressed it in the podcast, I realized recently as I be, as I begin to again investigate why I'm like that. Does it work? And 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 when you're doing a fitness brand, and you have and you're coaching kids and coaching people in fitness, like you get you get feedback continuously. Absolutely. Right. And so I began to see how hurtful my actions were. Hmm. And I began to see or feel how bad that made me feel. How bad it made the non-coach Bobby, the real Bobby, yeah. the Bobby who was you know, a stutterer, the Bobby who loves people, the Bobby who's creative, the Bobby who's kind of a nerd, how, how bad it made him feel. So I began to you know, investigate and learn. And I realized that I'm almost never mad at people mm. when I get on them. 
like we've said, we said before our podcast, we did a little like pre, did briefing or pre pre briefing, and I'm in a place with my fitness where I don't need to convince you yeah. of anything. Like I'm fit, I, I kid around, man. I'm yeah, I'm fit. I, when I met you, I was fit. When you decided <laughs> to, to, to leave me, I'm gonna still be fit. Correct. Um, but I do want to be liked. Mm. And no one says that, right? No, the guys don't say that. I do want to be liked. We all want to be liked. Absolutely. It's part of our natural um, inclination as human beings. We want to be liked. And I do want to raise my grade as a speaker. Mm. Like if, if there was an inter- internal grade that you gave yourself in life, in everything, in your relationships, in your, in, your, in your intelligence, like I have an internal grade that I give myself for my speaking ability. Mm. When I stuttered, it was an F. I still stutter, but when I when I when I identified as a stutterer, an ugly stuttering kid, it was an F. So I still want that grade to come up. Yeah, I want to feel better about my speaking. So when I can't get someone to do what I want them to do, mm, to right? Listen. And I taught a class. I'm teaching a class on leadership, and I and I and, and I define leadership as getting people to do what you need them to do. Yeah, right. And so it could be, I mean, so, so Hitler was a great leader. He was like, oh, what do you mean? He was a great leader. He, did he get people to do what he wanted? Yes. Correct. <laughs> right? I'm not saying morally he's right, but he was a, he was a leader. Hmm. Um, you know, slave masters, they were, they were leaders. I mean, so, so, so I removed the morality from it. And so I still want to be a good leader. And to me, if I can't get you to do what I want you to do, that reflects my ability to lead. Hmm. So when I get mad... It's this twelve-year-old kid, again, feeling like I'm not good enough. Yeah, and it's a natural desire to want to say, "Screw you! I'll go do it by myself." Yeah. But I can't go and do it by myself because I'm stuck here mm. in this role. That's stuck. But in that moment, I feel I'm stuck here in a role that I'm not designed for. I'm designed to just be by myself, play cornerback, mm. be in the office. And and yet, because God pulled me to to lead people, here I am, trying to lead you. If you listen, we both get along. If you don't listen, I get mad at the fact that now this stuttering kid that's inside of me is feeling, you know, feeling insecure because I think you don't like me mm. and won't listen to me because you think I'm ugly mm. and I can't talk. Mm. And that's what it. That's where it comes from. My anger is is is, is, yeah. is solely from that. Yeah, it's not because you won't do a burpee. It's oh. not because, you know, I have put all this identity in that moment into the fact that my identity now is a person that has muscles that mean nothing. Right. And the whole world's laughing at me because I can't I can't speak well enough to get this person to do what I want them to do. Wow. So we're now getting into the core. No, 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 no. That's Thank you. Again, that's why I said you're the person who's willing to always go there. And that's the most healing aspect of this podcast, to be honest with you. So we're getting into um, what I would call the root system of identity, Mm. right? Like, why do we create identities in the first place? As you said, it is a byproduct or a coping mechanism or an initiative for us to run from these aspects of self-hatred etc right yes Yes. and you said something about that kid and how everything is always brought back to surface right so it's like we create the armor in order to protect those elements that are so sensitive meanwhile those sensitive elements are actually always in control right always so it's always yes even when it's the, the the guy who wants to lead everybody right on the stage speaking to people it's actually just the child who wants to be heard yes right and who believe yes. that my worthiness comes from you listening to me and right. if you show me anything other than that then it obviously reflects what i already believe about me which is i'm not right. worthy to be listened to correct correct right and correct. you know i think sometimes we get this kind of delusion uh, it's possibly just a part of our programming. I think we're a lot more self-aware than we give ourselves credit for, all humans, right? But there is this delusion, I would call it, where we think that it, almost everything is about what's going on out there, right? So the reason I'm reacting to my girl in a certain way is because of her. 
The right. reason I'm reacting to Coach Bobby in a certain way is because of him. Yeah. Right? You said the thing and you made me feel this way. Yeah. And so yeah. you're the problem. Yes. And I think that's where the most contention starts to happen. And it actually is a disservice to our personal power because you're taking away from the reality that there's only one reason you can be triggered about anything. And that's yes. because there's already a wound that is existing, right? Or a perceived yes. wound per se. Yep. And so, you know, again, I want to take this back to like this cultural conversation we're having about identity and, you know, people trying to put these different labels on themselves pigeonholing themselves in essence, right? Mm -hmm. Putting themselves in these boxes and not even knowing it. They want to free themselves, but they do it by putting themselves in boxes. I want right, to exactly, myself. yeah. So like yeah. I wanted to I wanted to stand out. So then I become the antithesis of what my family would see as right, but I only right. go into another box, which yeah, could exactly. end up being a prison box or a casket right. box, right? Right. Exactly. Like, I'm going to be the thug, the gangster, the whatever because my family raised me to be the opposite and that yeah. way I'm going to get their attention. Yeah. Right, and I'm going to stand out, and I'm going to be this unique subcategory that they've never seen. But in reality, I'm just going into a mold that was already created for me, right? right. And right. I, I want to now kind of even take this dig. You know, the thing I love about you, Unc, is you know you're never in a posture of like blaming. Like you're you've never been like the conspiracy theorist or whatever. Even though you know what's going on, and you're yeah. hyperly aware, right? You're a Scorpio yeah. to your core. Like you, you're woke. Like you just see things different. But I want to get into this conversation of when you are in that perceived unhealed state, right? I believe it's perceived because we are whole. We just forget we're whole. And so we buy into another narrative. That's yeah, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. My, my thesis per se. But I want to get into this conversation of there is, there is a time when or a, a state when you are first developing and you create all or you start to adapt all these insecurities, you take them as your labels, you internalize them, and they become a part of who you are, per se, right? Then on the other side, you now enter into a society that feeds off of the insecurities that you have not worked through. And yeah. so again, for me, I had this moment again, writing where I said, Oh, my goodness. Okay, so my theory is that all of it is based in well, I said sex in that, but it's really procreation, as you would say, right? Mm -hmm. It's continuing our lineage. And so they know that there is an inherent insecurity within all human beings that was formed at a very young age, which takes that aspect, which is a natural aspect, but also takes this bonding of parents and, you know, affection and love and says, by the age of 14, 13, we already have a program that says, in order for you to be happy, in order for you to be um, loved, seen, appreciated, heard, you need somebody else to reflect it. And yeah. that comes in the form of what we call an intimate relationship, right? Right. So you're automatically on the subconscious and conscious search for a yes. mate, for somebody yeah. to fulfill you in these perceived needs. I need to be heard, need to be seen, need to be accepted, right? So you enter the gate with this desire more than a burning desire it's an obsession of finding the perfect person to yep. fulfill these aspects of self once you're in that state if i was let's say if i had completely malicious intentions i did not care about you but i cared about getting your dollar the very first thing i would do is tell you that hey look you're probably never going to find a mate the way that you look the way that you are the way that you think the way that you smell, the way that you dress, right? Oh, yes, I'm as exactly. many different factors as I can. And I say, but yep. look, I'll tell you this. I do believe that if you buy my clothing, yep. my makeup, my, cologne, my this, my yeah, cologne, exactly. correct. If yeah. you my purchase things, all yeah. of these goods, you will find that mate who's going to fulfill you, yep. right? And again, it's all built on this false premise of we need somebody to fulfill us. And so I yep. wanted to see where you would take that as far as like, what are your what are your thoughts around once we go into the world with these insecurities, how they get preyed upon, et cetera? Yeah, because because in that same scenario, right, and then and then because because we're all wired kind of the same way now, because because the shoes themselves, because you already have like you said, you begin to develop these these ideas, these subconscious uh, mag magnets that pull you in ways that you don't even know why you're getting pulled in this direction emotionally, right? Or psychologically. 
Uh, but everyone's getting pulled the same direction. Yeah. So now, the only evidence you have is again the mirror. Mm. So now those shoes that 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 marketing has told you you need to be sexy, when you get them, all of a sudden the opposite sex or the same sex looks at you and oh my god, okay, those are nice. So mm. it feeds that whole mm. that whole okay, this is good. Yeah, versus this is not good. So to the degree that. Um, you can't do that or don't do that, you develop other ways to make it happen, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, I think you're right. I think, you know, the, the, when you have situations, because we're, we're trying to find, we're trying to find a currency that works for us mm -hmm. in our world, right? And by currency, guys, I mean something that I can use that's a value that gains me the attention from the world, mm -hmm. right? Not necessarily opposite sex, right? That's our that's our procreation driver, but it could be the survival driver, which is the same sex, right? I need I need to prove that I'm I'm admirable to be in your in your in your in your community mm -hmm. or your same area, but also I need I need to in some way show that I'm capable of of either beating you in life or or being a good competitor mm. that's we're, we're driven that way women and men right i need to, i need to compete against you for other mates or for survival for whatever so our brains are wired so we're always trying to find ways to communicate that to people currency wise and when you don't have those things when the when 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 the world who's that's trying to gain a buck from you um when you can't access those currencies, you find ways to, mm. right? So now you become a drug dealer. Now you become a bully. Mm. Now you become somebody who's promiscuous. All that's not by accident. Yeah. It's, 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 that's why I look at these, these young people. I, you know, I, I teach young people. I'm a coach. And I just like to look at them and, and try to look at it, again, investigating. And, you know, I don't see kids who are just, you know, punks yeah. who are walking around with their, with their pants hanging down. I don't see girls who are just slutty. Mm. I just see people trying to figure out yeah. how to how to navigate a world in in an environment that we didn't grow up in. Mm. That's way more way crazier, right? And it's all predicated on them trying to figure out what given where I'm at in my life, given what God God has given me physically, emotionally, academically, psychologically, and given what, given what I have access to, how can I best survive as a human being in this world? Mm -hmm. And they don't think that way, survival, but their brain's wired that way. Yeah. So how can I attract people? How can I show, you know, like, like a peacock, how can, how can I show my power mm -hmm. in this classroom? Is it by laughter? Is it by, is it by being a dumbass? Is it by talking back? It's all like posturing. Absolutely. Right? And so I love viewing it from that standpoint. And then I love to, like you said earlier, to look at, okay, given all that, and given the billions of dollars that that corporations pay to get to our minds, mm -hmm. like how 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 are they trying to get to us? Yeah, you know what I mean. Exactly. So I view all that kind of like as a as a fun project yep. that I can partake in for ninety five hundred ten years of my life while I'm here, because to me, there's it's not good or bad. Yeah. You say you know, of course, Bobby has never been. You know, one to uh, to play the blame game or feel like a victim. Cause I, to me, it's just all kind of like it's interesting to me, yeah. all of it. Mm. And 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 I get mad. I'm not immune to getting mad. I I I I investigate and learn about ways where being an African American has made my life harder, mm. right? So I I can investigate that without being, you know, someone who's sitting there whining about it. Yeah. But to me, it's all like a cool project. Mm. That we get to partake in, and the problem is, which you probably know, you do know, that very few people are willing to do that. They rather just drink, have sex, watch movies, Correct. eat, binge, eat, and just live Monday to Friday, and for 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 thirty, forty years, and never sit down and figure out, okay, what, what is my part in this? Mm. What is your part in this? Yeah. Whoever you is, your friends, your spouse, your kids, your, and then what is the world trying to do? To fuck with this, excuse my language. <laughs> you know what I mean? To mess with this that we got going on, right? And once you figure that out, it's like, okay, I see you, I see you, world, I see you, universe, and then you can play the game. Uh, so you, you know, know, 
the, uh, when was this? Like three days ago, I was over at this little steakhouse across the street. And I seen people walking in and, you know, I was just looking at the demographics, a lot of older white people. And I saw this couple walk in and it was just this bigger kind of grotesque looking dude. And I looked over. So there were like people staring at me. I'm the only black one. I, yeah, I happened to have yeah. a tank top because I was, you know, just coming from the beating sun, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, muscles are popping, whatever. Shout out to Coach Popping. And so I looked over at him and I said... And, you know, I'd ordered the little steak and chicken. You know, that's it, right? And I'm looking over and I see them order. Before they order, I already knew what they were going to order. I knew it was going to be the burger. I knew it was going to be the fries, et cetera, right? And this right, is like, right. of like judgment, shame on you. I was really just observing. And I said, yeah. and I looked at him and I was like, wow, like that's the avatar he chose. Like that, those are the words that crossed my mind. That's crazy. I that's said, so true. I said, that's the avatar he it chose. Is so like, true. And he's 60 some years old now or late 50s, et cetera. And I'm just like, that's the choice that he made for himself. That's what he chose. That's a video. This you know what I mean? Me. That's a good one. Because you're right. Because if you can go through all the screens, scroll through all the avatars. That's the <laughs> one. Because we can, Correct. right? Correct. We can scroll through all the avatars and it's what he chose. That's yeah. the one you chose. And again, and you'll say no, but but what you just ordered would indicate otherwise. <laughs> right? You opted into that avatar every single exactly. time you ordered that thing exactly. and you did yep. that thing or not did that thing. Exactly. Yep. And so, again, I love that you brought in this element of, like, it's a game because, you know, the, the flipping of its head of this entire idea about identity is that identity is a trap. Like, the entire thing is a ruse. It's kind of like comparison, right? So, yes. I want to feel better about myself. So, I say, okay, I know, um, I know I'm pretty good looking. So, am I the best looking person in the room? And now I feel good because I am, right? And then somebody else walks in the room and they're a little better looking immediately I'm now the I'm now least. I'm the exactly. worst. Right? The worst. Right? Not There's even no two. middle. No, you're no, you're the worst. Yeah, yeah. Either at the very bottom or the very top. Like exactly. that's the thing with this entire charade of exactly. comparison. And when I started getting into the conclusion in that chapter of, of identity, is the thing the the entire premise of identity is flawed because it inherently says we are not we are these finite humans that can only be categorized in these specific spaces genres whatever right? right so for me the danger the greatest danger of my identification was actually not this kind of you know um black blah 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 blah. it was actually the positive identifications i created for myself that kept me in this box and those yes. were like okay i'm the funny guy right i'm the charismatic guy i'm the good speaker guy. i'm the this i'm the that i'm the spiritual guy all of those create this sort of construct for you to where you have to point you can never show up authentically anywhere in your life that's a good point you know what i mean and i realized and this was very recently where i said oh my goodness no like everybody has always known me to be a certain thing and a certain that and there were times i didn't feel like being that i didn't want to be on but then i felt i always had to be on that's me you know and then yeah. I finally made this decision, went out with um, my uh, my girl's friends, et cetera. We went out to the San Francisco State of the Art Science Museum, et cetera. And in the first like 20 minutes when everybody's at the table, I just sat there quiet. And I was already known as a person that's like, one of her friends says, oh, you can drop him off anywhere in the world and like he's going to be fine. Like she said that to my girl. Yeah. Well, already, I already had that image in their head of like, oh, right. blah, blah, blah. But that day, I, I just sat there because I didn't feel like I was just vibing to the music. I sat right. there. I was like at the head of the table, and right. really I saw people like peeking over. Like, is he gonna say something? Is he gonna comment? Is right. he gonna joke about this? He's gonna do that. And I said nothing. Yeah. A majority of that time, I just sat back and I did my thing. And it was a moment of freedom. As simple as it seemed on the surface, it was like I was breaking. No, it totally free. seems. Yeah, you know what I I'm mean, saying? I was yeah, breaking I totally free do. from that thing of needing to be anything for anybody. Yeah. Because yeah. our identities are, again, what are we identifying for? Coach brought this up in the very beginning and throughout this entire podcast is we are identifying with the mirror. Once we break the mirror or make the mirror irrelevant, now we're free. Yes. That's, that, that's so key. You feel me? Yeah, that's so key. Because, because I go through the same thing. It's like I can't. And, and, and I, I know I've told you this before, too. It's like there are, there are like 10 people mm. on this earth that know me pre me mm-hmm. and know me pre this. Yeah. Right? So yeah. my sister, yeah. my brother, mm-hmm. my dad, yeah. my mom passed away, my boys from college. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's five of them. That's eight people. Maria, my wife, my kids don't know me pre no. pre this. 
Maria kind of, but not, but not really, mm. not, not really. So everyone else knows me as, as the superhero. Mm. And so can you imagine the fear of being found out that I go through every time I'm not, cause I could prep for a talk. I could prep for a podcast. Yeah. I can be kind of in my, in my element for, for three hours at a football practice. But can you imagine going through going to the store or going to a barbecue or going to, or calling your calling one of your your you're calling your dad or, not, not your dad but calling like a friend or, or get, it's like wow. to have to be on all the time to have to like for fear of because they don't know me like I I talk about it enough my stutter and like feeling insecure but talking about it is different than doing it and yeah. being it right I'm still hiding it I'm talking about it yeah. But I'm still hiding it. Yeah. I'm still protecting it. Yeah. So, you're right. When you, if you, if if and when you're able to say, you know what, I'm going to the store and just yeah. how I'm looking right now. Correct. Like, yes. And, and I and I and I did it this this like this this weekend, and Maria was like, "You ain't gonna shower. You ain't gonna. You ain't gonna." I was like, "No, nah. no, man." But it's like, wow, it's freeing. But even doing that was just fearful because my identity exactly is as Coach Bobby, Correct. as badass Bobby. Correct. And that's not who I am. Yeah. Like you said, it's not. It's not. It, it's almost like you put yourself in a tighter box. Mm. You, you, you thought it was freeing because, in a way, it freed me from being afraid yeah. of being teased. So yes, when I was 14, 13, it was freeing because I felt like I could I could be in public and I didn't have to shy and, and stay in my room. Mm. But over time, it goes the other direction, yeah. and it, it puts you back into another box, right? It's a different box. It if that makes you feel better, it's a different sale. Yeah. It's got nicer <laughs> so, amenities. Oh, one, two, three, eight, amenities. seven, six. It's your new sale, right? <laughs> oh, Who's really? Nice yeah, same sale, dog. Same white, same white, same <laughs> nasty white, same rats. <laughs> but but you do you feel like you feel you think it's better, but it's a, it's still a fucking cage. Wow. You know, wow. It's still a box. So wow. um, you have to you have to recognize the good boxes yeah. as being the same as the bad boxes. Exactly, a box is a box is a, a box. box is a box. And yeah. so and so that brings me to because I know you got to leave in a little bit, get Amara to his game, but it brings me to a point where I am specifically, and this may not be for like if you're listening right now, you may only resonate with like I'm stuck in identity, like I'm just discovering I'm even in this yeah. identity I've created for myself. So this may be, you know, down the road, but I believe it is necessary to speak on and again to tell where I am and this has not come through, you know, magic. This has come through just listening to that spirit and heeding that call finally. And I'm in a space where unk it's like I literally no longer care what you see me as. And I remember I used to care like what is my Wikipedia going to say about like who I am and what I do. Oh right? yeah, exactly right. And right. even when people ask me it's like, "Oh, what do you do?" I used to be so keen to, "Okay, am I going to say the marketing angle? Am I going to say coaching? Like what do I use to impress them?" Now literally if somebody asks me what I do, like I will say like or where do I work? What I do for work? I say, "Well, this is what I do for play." Well, I like to write. Well, yeah, I like to, whatever totally I feel yeah. like at that moment. Oh, what are you doing? Like, this is what I'm doing. And it's yeah. like, again, stripping away these layers of what I believed I had to present myself as to be valuable. And even being of value in the marketplace, as we talked about with, you know, the woman who goes into communities or the painting, you know, analogy that I used is there's going to be one community and you might be in a community right now where you feel unvalued and undervalued, right? And then another yep. community where they completely value what you do. Right. Guess right, what? Exactly. None of them matter. <laughs> None of them matter. Like, at the end of the and day. It's, it's, the trick, it's the box trick, right? Correct. It's that, that, that even the positive stuff doesn't matter. Correct. Right, so exactly. it's like, okay, yes, these guys will pay you a million. Go where they're going to pay you a million so you can enjoy your experience and have more, you know, uh, fruits for your labor, whatever, right? But yeah. don't connotate that to your worth. It's like, I right. don't deserve a good life because I worked hard. If I do work and I write a book in two weeks or whatever, like that's no longer a, a merit for me. I don't care yeah. how long it took. I yes. don't care yes. what the process was. I care that I enjoyed yep. it, yep. right? I care that I got so much from it. 
And it's dope that I get to share with you guys. Like that's really the yeah. the, the spirit. And that is a place of true freedom because what we're seeking yeah. is a freedom from the opinions of those around us right. being what matters more than our own. And I'll, I'll right. cap it off for me with this line. When I was journaling the other day, I said, I said, in truth, I wanted your love because I believed mine was not enough. Oh, wow. And then fill in the blank and, 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 and actually it wasn't. Back then, right? Of course. It, it, I didn't, didn't believe it was. Enough. You didn't love yourself enough. Yeah, exactly. I didn't believe yeah. it was. Right. Right. And I filled in the And then I wrote the same statement, but with a the blank there. In truth, I didn't accept my blank because I believe mine was not enough. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. My, yeah, my like appreciation, that. my acceptance. You want a relationship. I want to be seen. So you're seeing yourself and valuating yeah, yourself. I like that. In the, you yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. the only reason you want it somewhere else because you believe theirs is worth more than yours. Right. And that's the entire, I believe that's the entire game. That's the entire game, the irony. Our eyes are turned right. outward and we believe right. the game is happening out there. But like Maha right. said this in the last podcast we filmed, she said, uh, Wayne Dyer says, you know, our, our eyes go this way, but truly the entire journey is to go this way. Like if they're turned yeah. inwards, you think yeah. it's all what's going on out there, but what you're seeking is already within. Yeah. That's the entire game about it. Yeah, and I'll I'll uh, I'll end it with this because that was because that inspired this thought that just came to me, right? Mm -hmm. Because for the viewers, you know, you know, I'm 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 watching Aquarius, Neff. I'm watching him like, and we we discussed this beforehand. Like he's he's in a place with his journey, mm -hmm. um, that is palpable. Mm -hmm. And you and and evident, right? And I, I use the analogy of me and my fitness, where I don't need you to listen to what, to what I teach you about fitness because I've been doing it too long, and it, it ain't really hurting me if you don't listen. That's yeah. where he's at, and I feel it. Um, but what just came to me as as you were talking was, we spend all this time, like, and I, I imagine a sweatsuit, mm -hmm. like what do you call the the text, the text, right? Of, of my son, the Nike loves, right? Yes, sir. Nike yeah. text, right? Uh -huh. So. We think our value is based upon that, yeah. right? Having having the right tech, the right color, the right brand, right? Mm -hmm. Where in actuality, and it's going to feel super weird to do this, the real joy, the real the real uh, authenticity, the real uh, uh, genuine nature of our being comes when you turn that inside out mm -hmm. and wear that outside and realize how little it hurts you to do that. And over time, how freeing it is to do that. Right? So just turn inside out. Whatever you, my, again, my that's cloak so is all good. this. Ooh, that's a ball. My cloak is all this. So, so to the degree you can, you can be um, despondent and not reliant upon what people see as your cloak and you can just wear it inside out, is the extent to which you will truly be free from an identity that is external based. Mm. And only then can you see what you're really made of, what your real identity is, which you had at birth, which has been written for you for your whole life, which has always been who you are. You can't see that until you turn that, until you turn it inside out. Oh. You can't see it. That's a bar. So for anybody, again, who that went over your head like a 757, if, you, if you're the talker, <laughs> Go to a place and be quiet. If you're the quiet one, go to a place and become the talker. Yep, and see exactly. that the thing that you fear the most exactly. was nothing at all. Oh, that's so good. If you if you muscular, go somewhere with clothes on. Wow. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> un, you convicted me For right real. now. I was looking at which tank top I'm about to wear to the gym. No. Now, <laughs> now I'm that's, different, though. that's different. That's different, though. <laughs> that's different. <laughs> you said that's different, though. <laughs> That's different though. That ain't different. <laughs> that was different. <laughs> That's exactly. I'm trying to show some. Oh my goodness. Wow. So thank you guys for joining us during this episode. Um, I often say this, like every time they're just getting better and better, they're getting more wide open. And I believe that, like, I just enjoy this again. I enjoy whoever it. Whoever yeah. watches, watch. Like we it. learn. We learn. If y'all watch, y'all sitting in our, our living room with us. Give me some lemonade. Correct. While you up. <laughs> while you up. <laughs> give me a water. Give me a sugar packet. Give me a lemon. Yep. Yep. You mean lemonade, sir? No. Give me a no. water. <laughs> give me lemon sugar. sugar. sugar lemon. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm done. Love you guys. Peace. All right, guys. Love you guys. See you guys next time. Be it now, and then it will come to you. You can't wait till you get it to become that thing.